Ah. Sure, Colonel. They're awfully dirty. I don't care, and I'm not paying. Perhaps I'll do them anyway. Good afternoon, Colonel. You're where? There's a bear on your roof. Yes. To the angel of the church in Sardis, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their cloth clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you, Joy. Um, so um, that's the message to the church in Sardis. Now Sardis was a church in what's nowadays Turkey, um, Asia Minor, um, and all the seven churches were churches in that area, um, and they were all Gentile churches. There they were, they were a few Jews as members, but mostly Gentiles in those churches. And all of the letters to the churches in in revelation they start off with with jesus introducing himself because it's jesus speaking um and all of the introductions refer back to the vision in chapter one so it says he's the one who holds the seven spirits of god and the seven stars um and that's how jesus introduces himself and the stars are the angels of the churches so jesus holds those the next bit is a statement to the church about what he knows. Every single one has I know or he, he, 
in, in a couple of them, he's, he just describes what he knows. So Jesus says he knows about the church. I know your deeds. And for Sardis, he says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Um, that's what he says about the church in Sardis. So they've kind of got this. Uh, everyone thinks, oh, well, that's a lively church. They're full of full of the life of the spirit. But actually inside the church in Sardis is dead. And he tells them they've got to wake up. He gives them in each of the letters, he gives the church some instructions of what they should do next. And in this case, he says they need to wake up. Um, which I'll get on to later. Um, so there's a correction for the things which are wrong uh, in the church. Um, and in this case, they need to wake up. There's two churches which don't have that. And that's Philadelphia and Smyrna don't have a, a, anything that's wrong with them. Um, but uh, all the other five do. Um, because we're pretty human, aren't we, all of us? We've all got generally we're doing something that's not quite right and we need Jesus just to tell us what we need to sort out and the churches are called to repent and change their ways and then there's an encouragement and a promise um, and in this one it says you will walk with me dressed in white for you're worthy the one who will who is victorious will be will be like them dressed in white i will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life but will acknowledge that name before the father and his angels so every single letter follows the same pattern and i wonder what jesus would say to our church um i wonder if we have need that wake up message to our church um it's in 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Because we can't really afford to sleep. We need to be awake. We need to be watchmen and women, looking out for what God is doing, what the devil's doing as he prowls around like a roaring lion. And I think there's going to be a time of testing over the next two or three months um, with with sickness. I, I, I do anticipate that that will be a challenge, even though we've got the vaccine coming online. I think that's something we need to be awake to. And, you know, we've been praying for for Mike and Jess and Paulette and the, the family because um, Mike's got coronavirus. Jess has got it. And Bradley's got it or he had it. I don't know how long it lasts for. But we need to be remembering that this is a, a serious situation. We need to be supporting people just as we supported Jono and the family when they went through a really difficult patch. I wonder if God's been teaching us and helping us to learn about what it means to intercede and pray for one another. Because we've got a testing time coming up, I believe. Um, and we need to pray for God. God was so gracious to us and protected us in the first wave. Um, and we need to pray for his help and protection during this second wave. So I think we need to be awake. We need to be alert. Um, and the reason I got that Paddington film was that the major in there, you saw him. He was he was in his room. He was a bit miserable. It was all gloomy because he had let the sort of muck of this world and everything cover his windows, whether it was too expensive or too much effort or he was just feeling depressed or whatever it was. He had allowed the muck of the world to come and cut out the sun, cut out the light in his life. And I think we can be like that. We can let <clears throat> things in our lives and particularly sins and things like that, we let them accumulate. We let it sort of, it starts with little bits and then it kind of becomes more and more dark and gloomy in our life as we allow those spiritual things to get on top of us. Hebrews 12. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run 
with perseverance the right race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. So all those things that kind of get, he's, he's got a picture of a runner here who gets all stuff caught round his legs and his arms and stuff and it can't run effectively. You need to get rid of all that stuff, all the stuff that um, holds you back and stops you from running the race. Um, and how do we do that? Well, that, that's all about repentance, which I'll get on to shortly. So let's throw off those things that hinder. Um, whatever things we struggle with tends to start off small and we don't even notice it partly and then it kind of grows and grows until we're actually imprisoned by it. We're, we're slaves to it and we need help from someone like little Paddington but maybe someone a bit more powerful than Paddington. He comes and cleans the window but God actually cuts those snares. Jesus comes and lets the light in because he is the light. I was walking along a path the other day. It was quite slippery on one side, but where the sun had shone, all the ice had melted and it was quite safe there. Um, and just as that that guy, the, the colonel, had allowed all that muck to clog up his windows and not let the light in, we sometimes have things which we put up to stop the light coming and melting those footpaths of life um, so that we can walk safely if we allow the sun to shine on them but if we don't if we deliberately say oh I don't really want all of that to come in then we're going to be walking on slippery paths so we need to fix our eyes on Jesus it says in Hebrews um, and uh, we want to just we need to look at what the word of God says in the Bible and allow it to speak to our lives as well in in two chronicles um, there's a passage we read quite a lot back in March and April um, it was last year <laughs> can you yes it still feels almost like this year but it was last year there's a long prayer of Solomon in two chronicles chapter 6 and then in chapter 7 God answers and I'm just going to read that little bit there so it's two chronicles 7 11 to 14 when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so there's no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So if God's people who are called by his name, that's us, we're called Christians because of Jesus Christ. We're called by Jesus' name. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. It's difficult to humble ourselves sometimes, isn't it? We read bits of the Bible we don't like and we think, oh, do I have to humble myself and accept that? Somebody once said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that are difficult. It's the parts that I do. It's hard to humble ourselves. It's hard to go back on stuff that we've said and then actually we find out we're wrong and we have to admit we're wrong. It's hard to make ourselves vulnerable. Um, there are some people who are really good at just being open and honest and vulnerable and some of us find that more difficult. But sometimes we need to make ourselves vulnerable to one another and admit mistakes. So humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face. And that takes time, that takes effort. Um, set aside time to seek God's face, not doing some things we'd like to do, but actually seek after God and pray and turn from our wicked ways. Now, you know what your wicked ways are, I don't. I don't really want to know particularly, but uh, some, you know, there are often we, we kind of have some stuff in our life that we don't tell anybody about that we need to, to get rid of, we need to sort out. 
Um, God knows about it already, so he's not going to be embarrassed by it. That's the wonderful thing about having a God who knows and loves us intimately. He's not going to be shocked. He's not going to be surprised because he knows about everything already. So if we have those wicked ways, we need, ways we need to turn away from them. We need to repent and stop it and not make excuses. And that includes me. And then God's forgiveness and healing can come and heal our land and ourselves. So I, I think we ought to decide today that that's what we're going to do. Whether we need to wake up as a church, whether we need to wake up as individuals. I don't know if that's if that's the right message for today, but it's quite possible that it is. Um, and just let ourselves be open to God and let us be open to his correction and turn from those things that we know are not glorifying God and are not helping us in our daily life. In fact, they're fogging up the windows of our life and keeping us miserable and not allowing the light of God to come in and uh, cause our lives to be glorifying to God. Let's, I'm just going to pray and then we'll have one or two songs of worship after which um, Kath and Roger are going to lead us in communion. Lord Jesus, thank you for your messages to those churches in Revelation and Lord, help us to hear what you're saying to our church and to each one of us individually today. Help us to know what it is that you want us to understand. You know about them already. You knew what was going on in the church in Sardis. You know about what's going on in our lives and in our church. Thank you that you love our church, that you love your people who you've called together to be yours. And Lord, we want to be a church which just brings pleasure to you and glory to you and which reaches out into the world which you love and brings your good news. Lord, please uncover the stuff in our lives that we need to get rid of, we need to sort out, we need to bring before you. And may your light shine on us and through us shine on to others. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh,